Okay, a lot. Okay, nice. Everyone who isn't a factory member, remember these people around you that just raise their hands because they can answer any questions if perhaps I happen to forget anything for you. So um, what is factory? So essentially, we are a business club for innovative thinkers. So where we stand today, we have almost 3,000 members um, and they come from a super eclectic, diverse uh, background. So we have, for example, a lot of corporates in the community such as Audi, Deutsche Bank and Siemens that are working in a variety of innovation projects. Uh, we have a lot of big startups in-house who, of course, are really great for the mentoring and uh, inspiration factor for a lot of the younger people in our community. We have a lot of first-time founders, people who are perhaps on their first, second, third venture, you know, starting an idea from scratch, trying to build a team, find some funding, and really see how their ideas can flourish. Um, of course, we have a lot of freelancers as well, perhaps some of you guys here in the, um, in the audience. So they range from developers to designers to copywriters and everything in between. We have a lot of university students, so people who are really in these formative uh, years of their career who are hoping to get exposed to entrepreneurship, new ways of thinking, new ways of working. And of course, we're Berlin, so it's a very creative community as well. So we have uh, musicians, DJs, artists, and everything in between. So all of our members are here to essentially work on a variety of different projects. So um, they range from mobility to sustainability, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and really everything in between. So there's really no um, limit to what you can do here at Factory. So um, of course, a huge part of what we do here are our events. Um, and indeed, 80% of the events that we do are actually initiated by our members. And tonight is one of them that's been initiated by one of our members here, Fabian. So um, before I invite the speakers on stage, I'm just going to uh, invite you all to participate in one of our long-standing factory traditions. Uh, so of course, we're all about networking, getting to know each other. So I'm going to give you all one minute on my little analog watch here um, for you all to say hello to the people around you. So turn to the people on your left, on your right, both sides if you're feeling festive and get to know each other. Okay, go. Okay, alrighty. Don't know if I'll get you to stop talking now. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Okay, so now it's time to welcome our speakers on stage. So without any further ado, um, please, I welcome to join me on stage our speakers for this evening, Scott Shakon and Fabian Tausch. Please give them a warm welcome. Okay, so 
I don't know what you guys were all doing when you were 21 years old, uh, but I certainly wasn't as impressive as Fabian over here. So um, Fabian is one of our members. He's been with Factory for over a year now, I think. Um, and Fabian runs one of the most, well, the most successful podcast for young entrepreneurs in Germany. I'm sure some of you are listeners. Perhaps you know about it. Um, somehow in your spare time, which he apparently has, he also runs a consultancy business for podcasting. Um, and indeed, we have Fabian to thank for bringing Scott here this evening. So thank you so much for taking that initiative. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Fabian, who of course can welcome Scott. Probably doesn't need much of an introduction for all of you guys. Co-founder of GitHub, co-founder of Chatterbug. And of course, we're really happy. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us here this evening. Um, but yeah, so I wish you guys a wonderful evening ahead. If you have any questions about Factory, want to have a chat, have any questions, come to find me, find one of the staff, we're all around here. Um, and I wish you a really lovely, inspirational evening ahead. So thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Hannah. So before we start, um, just a short reminder or just to make you aware of, you can ask questions to Scott because we have a short Q&A in the end. Um, it's slide.do and you have to enter the code A499 afterwards and then you can um, ask your questions and in the end I'll propose them to Scott. So thanks for having us here and thanks for showing up. I think I never hosted an interview with that many people in the audience so kind of nervous but as Hannah mentioned, uh, I interviewed since I'm 19, now I'm 21, and more than 100 interviews in the last time, and we already did one, so I'm happy to have you here, Scott. Everybody knows you're the co-founder of GitHub. You sold to Microsoft for quite a lot of, amount of, um, lot of, lot of money, and um, now you're running Chatterbug. So the first question after I welcomed you on stage again, so thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, is how did you feel when you became kind of a billionaire uh, in two days? Because you told me the last time we met you were not involved in the... <laughs> it's, it's so funny. In the discussions about the deal, you were just informed that GitHub will be sold two days after for around $7 billion. I think that's a good message to start with. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I've... I left GitHub about two years ago uh, to start the new company that's mostly based in Berlin here, which is why I spent a lot of time here, um, uh, called Chatterbug, which is a language learning service. And, and I left the board of GitHub maybe a year after that, so I'm, I'm not really in daily conversation with people at GitHub that, that often anymore. Um, I try to keep up with people there that I know, obviously, but, um, but yeah, so they, they called me about a week before the close to, to let me know um, that Microsoft wanted to, to get a letter of, of endorsement from, from major shareholders. And so I found that out while I was vacationing with my family uh, for Memorial Day and uh, tried very hard not to tell anybody or look really weird and stressed out um, because it is, you know, I mean, it's big news. I, my, what I thought was going to happen was that GitHub would IPO probably, you know, in five or, or seven years. Um, and, and so it, w it was a surprise and it was interesting. And honestly, the first thing that went through my mind the first day um, was uh, I don't have to raise a Series A for Chatterbug. And that was actually probably the biggest, th that was like the number one thing that I thought about is I don't have to beg people for money anymore for, for new ventures that I want to do. So um, I, if any of you guys uh, pitch, know that it never gets easier or less stressful until you have all of the money yourself and can just put it into whatever you want to do. Um, and, and that's the number one thing that you think about is not having to ask people for money anymore. So besides that, you didn't have to ask people for money anymore. What did change inside of Chatterbug? Um, so nothing's changed inside of Chatterbug because um, we haven't, I mean, we're running it exactly the same as, as we would before. Um, we, the, the deal with Microsoft hasn't closed yet, so it's still subject to regulatory approval. It probably won't close until sometime uh, before the end of the year, hopefully. Um, but we're trying pretty hard not to change anything that we wouldn't have done because it's quite possible that you know, it doesn't close and then I do have to go out and raise money 
Um, and then that is an embarrassing position to be in if you've been like, ha ha, I don't need your money. Um, so you don't want to do that and then have to go out and ask for it. Um, so I've tried, we've tried pretty hard not to do that. Um, but also, you know, I mean, even, even afterwards, I don't think we would do it differently than if we had raised the normal sort of Series A round. Uh, we do want to hire a little bit more. Um, but I think when you're trying to build something that you, that you love to do, uh, Chatterbug is, is a really a, a huge passion project of mine. It's something I, I want to, to do. You know, even, even with the, the GitHub sale, like, my life hasn't changed that much. I still work in code every day, trying to build features for the, the, the website that I work on you know, with a, a two dozen employees or so, and still it's still a small startup, you know, sort of, sort of mentality. And, and I think it's just because that's what I love to do, right? Like, I think um, when, when an event like this happens, it gives you freedom, and, but, you know, if you loved doing what you were doing before that, then your life doesn't change that much. I think that's very important to realize that if you do what you love, that you, it won't change that much even when you have the money, but of course, it's it's making life easier. Um, so, who didn't? Who would not? Who would not want to to get that amount of money? But um, if we look at Chatterbug, I think one thing is very interesting because you mentioned that you are from Berkeley, like you're living in Berkeley, but you're founding the next company in Berlin. And I think there are several reasons for that. But in Berlin, always a problem is that everybody thinks they have to go to Silicon Valley at some point. And now we have somebody here who is from San Francisco and founded with a reason in Berlin and is traveling a lot between the cities. So I would love to have your opinion on why did you found Chatterbug in Berlin? Yeah, so I mean, there's a big difference between uh, GitHub was very engineering oriented. We had mostly engineers as employees for a long time. Chatterbug is essentially a language school. That's online, and so we do have engineers. They're mostly the co-founders. Um, we have a couple of other engineers that we've hired, but um, the majority of, of the employees that we've hired have been uh, curriculum developers, curriculum designers, teachers, um, and finding curriculum developers, finding people uh, of that nature that have a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different um, mother tongues, you know, that, that, that have teaching experience, is much easier to do, I think, uh, in Berlin than it is in San Francisco. And cost of living is less here, and office space is, is more affordable here. And so I think it's, it's, I think as time goes by, it's more and more crazy to do anything business-wise in San Francisco because the, everything's so expensive. Um, and so if you are of a startup mentality and you're trying to, to be, you know, spend your money wisely, um, hiring in San Francisco is one of the stupidest things you can do because it's, it's incredibly expensive to, to hire people there. And there's, there's a lot of competition. If you're in Europe, there's less competition. There's lots of really smart people um, and really smart people that, that companies with too much money in San Francisco completely ignore. And so I think if you, know, if you come here and have an interesting project and an interesting company, um, I, I, would, I, I tell everybody in San Francisco that they, if they can, that they should base a company in Berlin um, or in Europe uh, instead of in San Francisco or you know, elsewhere in the United States as well. For us, because it's a language learning company, we do a lot of European languages. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to be in Berlin. It's such an international community. Um, there's tons of expats here that you, wouldn't, you don't get in Paris or, or, or Madrid or something like people. Is, I mean, raise your hand if, if you aren't German. So, I mean, this is why you start a company in Berlin, right? Like, this is, it's, it's easy to get people from all over. And I think, honestly, diversity really helps build a great company. And so if you're in a, a city that is primarily and fundamentally very diverse, um, that it's, it's easier to build a good company that way. Um, and San Francisco is not like that. So, um, I mean, I live there because I have a house there and a family there. And, um, but I'm here every month or so. And, and I think as the company grows and becomes more global, Berlin will always be really sort of the center of, of the heart of the company. One thing that's very important to build a successful company is networking, like knowing people that can help you out or part you can partner with or whatever. And I think a lot of people have the fear that in Silicon Valley the networking could be better than in Berlin. and. Um, that might be one of the reasons that a lot of people think they have to go over to Silicon Valley. I'm very interested to get your opinion on that as well because I think you're doing it quite well with uh, parties, uh, but also 
but also with um, Chatterbug events here in Berlin. And is it possible to get the same effect or a better networking effect here in Berlin than in, in SF? Yeah, I mean, I always felt that events like this were the best way to network. Um, even in GitHub, I felt like we didn't, we, even, even the original um, sort of first key customers that we had were not based in San Francisco and, and weren't people that we met in San Francisco. Um, I think the, if you want to raise money, there, is, there, is, are, there are a lot of VCs there, but there are a lot of VCs in Europe as well, and, and there's less competition for them, so I think it, it depends on, on you know, what you're doing, like who you're trying to network with. For, for me, I was always networking with developers, like that was, that was everybody we were hiring at GitHub, everybody that we ended up hiring at GitHub, the first 50 employees were probably majority people that I met at conferences. So, and rarely conferences in San Francisco, it would be conferences in Seattle or conferences in, in Oklahoma or, or you know, wherever they would have some Ruby conference or Rails conference or, or something. Um, we would go, I would go and talk, I'd give a talk on Git or whatever and then drink with people at the after party and meet people and that's, that's how we networked, right? And, and so I don't think that being in one particular city, especially San Francisco, is particularly helpful for that. I think, I think it's, it's, you know, if you can have a remote company, then you can network everywhere and get great people all over the place. Um, but, but yeah, I, 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 that's, that's one of the things that I'm able to do because we can hire people remotely and, and we can have a, a remote company and GitHub is like that and Chatterbug is like that to some degree. But it's great having everybody in Berlin um, as well, and, and, and we've had a, a bunch of great events in Berlin, and we get to meet a bunch of people in Berlin. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't think San Francisco is any better at that. So for everybody who had fear that they have to move to San Francisco to do a successful company, maybe you are happy right now. Uh, I think one question that's um, also a good one to ask is, uh, somebody, especially somebody who is uh, building a successful company, or built a successful company already, like GitHub. What did you do at Chatterbug that you learned at GitHub that it's the right thing to do when you found a new company? Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the big it's it's interesting talking to people about the new company because it's a language learning company, and and I got into it because I was living in Paris um, the last year or so that I that I worked at GitHub. I'd moved to Paris, and I tried to learn French when I was there, and it was very difficult to do. And people get confused because, you know, I, I'm a tech guy. I wrote a tech book, Pro Git, um, actually a couple of books on Git. I always gave technical talks. I, I ran a, a very technical company and then left and then did something that is very sort of humanitarian, like not humanitarian, but in the humanities, right? It's very sort of social um, and, and sort of the opposite of, of tech, really, right, is, is teaching people human languages. Um, and I think it's confusing. When it, usually when I say I'm, it's like a language learning company, they're like, oh, so like Java and Python? And you're like, no. Um, uh, but, but I think the thing that's in common with it is that it's something that is interesting to me, right? Open source was very inter interesting to me, and I, I felt that there was a lot of frictions and a lot of inefficiencies in being able to create open source and share open source. And so the project was very exciting to me because of, of the process of making all of that much, much easier, right? To get more done with less um, in a way that is great for the person doing it, for the, for the consumer. And at the time, you know, people thought that we were crazy doing GitHub, and none of us really thought it would be anywhere near as big as it was because um, because most developer-centric software wasn't really with the developer in mind, it was with the, pers the, the manager in mind that had to procure money for the, the software. And so it was all about features and it was all about um, you know, how many checkboxes you could do and how you could sell this thing to, for a lot of money to a bunch of developers and not about whether the developers like to use it, right? It was, a, it was a large market that was poorly served. So it's not like GitHub came from nowhere. We had tons of competition, we had SourceForge, we had um, Clearcase and Subversion and, and, and Perforce and like these huge companies, Microsoft was a competitor, right, with, with, with uh, their VCS stuff. And so it, it was, people said the same thing, it's a crowded market, but I think a crowded market poorly served is one of the most interesting markets to get into because it means it's a real human need and, and if everyone sucks in it, then it's a, it's a great thing to get into. And I, and I felt that way with, with language learning as well, like trying to learn French. I did italki, I did Duolingo, I did Alliance Francaise, I did personal tutors. Um, I, I tried all of these different methods and they were all horrible in different ways. 
And, and so if you see something like that, I think it's, it's really interesting to say, here's a huge market that has tons of competition, but they all suck at it. Um, and if you can think of a better way and create that better way and, and have something in the world that you would want to use, um, that you would have paid for if it had existed, right? Um, then that's, that's an interesting thing to do. That's a good market to get into. And so that's, that's how I see them being similar, um, is, is I think coming back from that to your original question, which was, um, which was what, do you, what do you bring from it? I think it's a sense of product, of user-focused product, right? That you're not thinking about who you're selling this to or how you're going to make money or how you're going to optimize the funnel um, or, or you know, how you're going to do really interesting metrics or something. It's about do users love using this thing and does it get them to accomplish what they originally came to accomplish trying to do it? And, and I feel like not enough people ask that question, right? Of, of do people love using this product and do, are they successful in doing what they want to do? Just one thing that I want to add or want to uh, ask you again is, as we talked the last time, you talked a lot about making it as easy as possible to get customer feedback and not being, yeah, shielding yourself and shielding your company from customer feedback with too many clicks or whatever. Why do you think it's so important to get as much feedback as possible? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard to get good customer feedback in any sense. Nobody, nobody, when people love the product, they don't take time out of their day to say, I love this product. When people hate the product, they don't take time out of their day to swear at you um, unless you really piss them off. And so I think if somebody wants to say, hey, I have a problem with this, you should make it take as little amount of time to do as possible. You should make it as frictionless as possible to tell you there's something I don't like about your website because that's the only way that you're really going to know unless you stand behind users and watch them use your thing, which some people do you know, when you get bigger. It's much more efficient to just make it really easy to get feedback more, more often from people. Let them vent. Let them say, I don't like this thing or, or this didn't do what I thought it was going to do. And if they have to click on help, and then you know, choose the topic that they want to complain about, and then that sends them to another page, and it says, here's a couple of help articles. Do these answer your questions? And you're like, no, I just want to fucking, it's, just give me a thing. And then you have to go to another thing that's like, fill out your name and your email address, and then give me a topic, because like, why, like, why would you put a top, like just write what the problem is, right? Like, they're logged in, why do you need my email? You know what my email and name, anyways, sorry. But <laughs> it, like, go to your website, of whatever website you have, and, and just say, okay, I have a problem. How many clicks and how much time does it take me to send feedback to my team? And which of those steps are unnecessary, right? So we have um, an intercom thing. And so on our website, on every page, you can hit the thing and there's immediately a text box and you just say, I have a problem with this and you hit enter and it goes into our, our thing and, and we, we triage them, right? And so you don't have to do any of those steps. And I, and I think that's really powerful. Um, I think it's, it's it, the other thing is that if you send an email to any of your customers and it's a no reply address, go fuck yourself. Because that means that you are okay sending them spam, but you don't want to get anything back. From, you're like, I don't have time for your bullshit, but I will send you mine. And, and I think it's a really shitty attitude to have. Um, I think any time you send an email, it should be respondable and people should be able to say anything they want and it should go into your ticketing system because that is a, another really good way of getting feedback. And any time that they want to and they get frustrated and they don't, then you miss out on that and you make them mad, right? Whereas if you make them mad but you listen and you fix the thing, then you have super fans, right? Like people really love that they, they, they get listened to and something gets addressed. So um, I think that that's, it's the easiest, more, most powerful way to, to respond to your customers. Um, and to, to make fans and to make your product better, right? To, to, to react to what they actually want. Okay, so breaking it down, it's about product and making people loving your product. Um, so I want to challenge you in a good way because I know that you are learning German right now with Chatterbug. Oh, so <laughs> would, would you mind introducing yourself again with, uh, in German just to show that your product <laughs> really works? <laughs> Kannst du deine Produkt benutzen? Ähm, ja, also, ja, mein Name, ich bin Scott Chacon, ich bin Mitbegründer auf äh, Chatterbug und GitHub und äh, ja, ich bin hier in der Factory mit alles und äh, ich bin sehr, sehr, ja, voll zu, zu, ja, es ist okay. Ich, Your hands together. Nicht, aber ja, <lacht> ich bin ein bisschen besser im Englisch, aber ja, ich kann, ein, ich kann eine einfache Konversation haben, wenn du, ja, wenn du bist. I think the yeah 
worst moment that I had was when you told me that you were listening to my podcast ja, da, um, to learn German. Ja. And I was like, Aber du hast zwei jetzt, ja? Not yet, not yet. Ah. The second one is not published, but <laughs> thanks for the promo. <laughs> <laughs> But I was like, oh, I, I have to produce better content and better and better and better that, that you're um, getting something out of it as well. But um, I was honored when I, I heard that you were listening to it to learn German. It's funny. I, so I, um, I listened to the Jungle Unternehmer podcast that, that he does. And uh, it's a really good way because it's, it's, it's you know, focused on this type of stuff, right? And, and this is vocabulary that I, I need when I'm having conversations with people. And, and telling people that I, I am learning German a lot of times at events like this, we'll go over and drink beer and they're like, show me your German. And so I, uh, I've, I've gotten a little bit better at, at, at getting into that. Um, but the, 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 your podcast is really helpful because it is talking about startup stuff, right? And so like, I can try to follow along and listen to startup stuff. So I actually am a fan, which is funny because uh, when we did the interview last time, I was like, ah, it's just like the voice I hear in my head when I do my dishes. <laughs> uh, so again, I'm honored, but um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, you're right. <laughs> but um, coming back to, to uh, founding a startup and... How many people here are founders themselves? So I think, uh, how many are developers? And just interested in Scott? Okay, so you have to ask <laughs> questions later because I have no idea of coding or whatever. I'm really, really bad with that, so you have to ask questions uh, to him later. and Or use Slido, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, coming back to, to the startup, founding process. We mentioned product, customer feedback, but also um, yeah, crowded markets that are not really good served. Are there other key factors that you would put into to make it successful? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, diversity is really important in staffing. I think that was one of the things that was difficult for us at GitHub because at GitHub, we were, building, we were engineers building a tool for engineers. And so we were all engineers, and we were open source engineers, and so what we saw was the open source sort of development model where there isn't really a hierarchy, there isn't really a process, um, or they'll, they'll develop their own processes, but they're, they're kind of fluid, and, and they're kind of mean to each other and in some of the, the larger uh, instances. And, but we would look at this and say, if they can do it, then you know, there's no reason for us not to do this. This is how we're writing software normally, like, why don't we do this sort of for the business? <clears throat> and had this more flat model that worked for a while, um, but there are good reasons. If you go to business school, you probably know there are good reasons, that there are historical reasons that this doesn't work for very long. Um, and once you get to, to sort of these Dunbar number sort of things where people don't trust each other, 100 people, 150 people, people don't innately trust each other anymore, there's more clicks, there's more tribalism even within the company, um, that not having a, a management structure at all really, I think, hurt us. Um, and hurt all of the employees, right? And, and, and so that was something that I think we immediately did is make sure that there's one person that you report to, there's one person that is, is in charge of, of making sure that you're happy, right? And that you know what's expected of you. And that was something that we didn't ever really have at GitHub, and it was very painful to implement it later. Um, and so I think that was the big thing. It doesn't have to be a, a big deal, right? It's just when you start at the company, this is your manager, right? And you guys do regular sort of one-on-ones, and they make sure you're doing okay, and, and, and they, they understand what's, what's expected of them and if they're meeting those expectations or not. And, and that, that, I think, can last for a long time. But if you don't do it when you first start the company, it becomes really painful to implement it afterwards. Um, we also run a, a remote company. That was another thing that I found worked really well, of being able to hire people um, pretty much any, anywhere in the world. We are trying in the new company to, to try to sort of center the, it around hubs. So we try to get people mostly in, in Berlin. Um, and if we can move them to Berlin, we will. But we'll also, you know, I mean, we would be open to, to hire if people move away from Berlin. You know, that's fine. Like, we can make it work. Most people in Berlin can work from home whenever they want to. So. Um, we, do, we do try to make it more, I work from home, even in San Francisco, we have an office there, I work from home most of the time, most of the co-founders work from home a lot, um, and we'll get together in person once a week or something, but I think being able to, to have a remote-centered culture, um, one that's, the office is Slack more than the physical space, um, uh, I think is a, is a really powerful tool for having flexibility with, with employees and, and making sure that they can 
um, do what they need to do in their lives, right? That, that, that if they have to pick up their kid from school and, you know, if, if you have a more diverse um, company, which, which in a language learning company, we do, right? It's not all engineers. We have a, we have a curriculum team that focuses on teaching how, how we want to teach, what do students need, and they inform the engineering team, here's what we want to do, and then the engineering team implements something and they, they have to work together, right? At GitHub, it was engineers building stuff for engineers and there was really no back and forth. There was nobody, there's no product team, right, um, that was sort of separate. And, and having a teachers as a product team is really interesting. Um, and so I think it, it works a lot better. Having, you know, parents, having, you know, single people, having just sort of a, a broader array of, of people and not just, you know, 20-year-old single guys in San Francisco, I think that, that makes for an unhealthy um, uh, environment pretty quickly. So, um, so that's, that's sort of the other thing, right, is just having a management structure and having more diversity um, from the, the beginning. Talking about team, just curious, what was the first hire you did at Chatterbug? Um, so the first hire we did was uh, developer um, uh, design, sort of design developer, uh, front-end engineer, I suppose. Um, because it was all my design before that, pretty much, and that is horrible. You don't want that design on your website. And uh, so that was the, the first hire, um, and then that was in San Francisco, and then um, the, the first hire after that was our curriculum developer. Actually, I think we hired them at the same time. Uh, she was living in, in Brazil at the time and, and has now moved up to, to Berlin to grow the team here as we've hired a bunch of other curriculum people. So, um, and then the first hire here was uh, Anne. I don't know if you know Anne, our COO, um, uh, who's our, our COO and, and has helped build out the, the whole Berlin operation, which has been invaluable. So she's the person everybody reports to, right? Yeah, Okay. she's the boss. <laughs> she's all, also the boss of you? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I, I realized that when we did the interview the last time, because it was like, uh, you were like, oh, it's fine, you don't have to send it uh, to us again. And she was like, no, I want to see it before. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was funny. Um, talking about uh, team, just to, to stick to it, because I think it's a really important topic when it comes to building your startup, and I have it in nearly every interview. What do you do with that many diverse people to keep it together and to make it like a family and make it feel like a family uh, all day long without losing track? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think there's a, there's a difficult line between the, are you friends with the people that you work with or not, right? I think you need to um, not force everybody to be your friend. That's not why they're working at the company. They're working at the company to do something interesting. And so it needs to be, if they don't hang out with you after work, that they're not, they're not taken as seriously or something. I think that's a very easy sort of bias to fall into. Um, but you want to make sure that people are happy, that people have lives, that people can take care of their kids if they have kids, that people can spend time with their, their spouses if, if they're married. Um, or, or significant others or whatever, and respect that time. If they don't want to drink, that you don't only do events that, that are solely, which I'm horrible at, at not focusing on because I, I love to drink, but, um, but you know, it's also very hard not to be friends with people in a small company that you spend a lot of time with and you're building something new with and you're excited about the product and you re respect what they do and you, know, you go out for team building exercises and, and dinners and things like that and you, you do become friends with, with people and so I think it's a difficult line to, to, to draw. Um, but I think that the number one thing is just respect, right? Like you have to respect everybody that works for you, respect that they have good intentions and that they're smart and you hired them for a good reason. Um, and, and give them freedom um, and, and, yeah, trust. So respect and trust. I could have just done that much more succinctly. I apologize. I get long-winded sometimes. No problem. I think we jump into Q&A as I got the questions right now because I think maybe we get some more questions afterwards. First question is, what do you think will be the next major disruptions in software engineering, tools, process, whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's, it's really interesting. I think um, there will be a lot more AI in, involved in writing software. I think as software development has progressed, it seems like it's very similar, but I think 
um, there's much less reinventing the wheel, right? I think GitHub has helped a lot with this, where if I want to, to, to write something, I go to GitHub and I search for it, and I see if somebody else has written it, and I use that first, and if it doesn't do quite what I want, then I modify it, and this is the beauty of open source and the beauty of, of GitHub still to me, right? Um, I still use GitHub every day. I still pay for GitHub, actually, for, for the new company, um, which is sort of highly ironic now, but... Um, but I find that, that, that really valuable, that, that we're not all reinventing the wheel all of the time. I think there's been a huge efficiencies in sharing, right, of, of, of that nature. Um, I think, you know, when that doesn't work, what most of us still do is Google for something, find, find the, the general solution on Stack Overflow, copy that, modify it. And so I think that type of thing will, will be made easier with, with more machine learning, more AI, where it can say, is this what you're meaning to do, and like kind of help you build that modifying it or use more libraries. I mean, libraries are really, um, you know, scaffolding for, for doing a lot more stuff a lot easier. Um, and, and so I think just being able to generally describe what you're trying to do and have it write most of the code will be where, where software development really moves. So if we're talking about software development specifically, um, then I, I think re just massive reuse and having machines help you do more faster um, is, is uh, where it's going to go. It's, it's an interesting question, though, because it's not, you know, you can tell three software developers, like, to build a thing and even have a pretty good spec on what it is, and they'll all do it massively differently, and they're all good solutions. They can all be fine solutions for it, right? So it's not, it's not a discrete problem set. So it's, it is hard to train a computer to do it entirely. It's, there, there still is a creativity and a craft to it that I think is going to be impossible to completely remove. Um, unlike, you know, driving yourself from A to B or something, where it's, it's, it's a super discrete problem that doesn't really need human creativity behind it. So, um, so yeah, I, I think there are bigger things to disrupt with, with artificial intelligence or, or with smarter computing systems. Um, software development will just change. Perfect. Thank you. So whoever um, asks the questions that I will read out, please follow up with Scott if you want to have uh, follow-up questions with him. I'll be so by the bar with a beer. So just take a beer, grab a beer and go to Scott. I think you're you're good to go then. The second question is what advice would you give to those who are 22 and have just finished their studies? Oh, um what are the studies in? I don't know. <laughs> is the person I, here who asked the question has something so, specific in mind? I mean, it's it's hard. Okay, so the best advice that I could give, I think, is don't listen to assholes like me. That, that, you know, you think maybe know a lot because of the survivor bias, right? I, I, I don't think I'm that much different than most of the other people I know. I happened to choose the right thing at the right time, and it became really huge in a way that I never expected. And so to think that I actually know, I mean, I can talk about what I learned at GitHub, and maybe that's applicable to you, and maybe it's not. Um, but, but to think that I would know what to do in your shoes, I think, is not... Is not um, is not true, and, and I only say that in that trust what you want to do, right? Trust what, you, what is interesting to you, what you love doing, whether it works out or not, that, that you were glad that you did it because it's an interesting thing or you learned something or, or you grew, um, but, but don't do something because you think you're going to get rich off of it or like that will never make you happy. You'll never, you'll never be interested, even if it works out you're not going to be happy at the end of that of that process, right? Like, you need to enjoy what you're doing. So, I mean, it's, it sounds really stupid to say, like, follow your heart or something really pat, but, I mean, I think the biggest thing is don't listen to people you think are smarter than you, right? Like, learn from them, filter it, decide whether it's applicable to you. That's fine. Like, like take people's experiences and learn from them. But if they say this is right or this is wrong, then they don't know any better than you do. Like, you can look at all these VCs that make all these investments in companies that they think are going to be big, and then 90% of them die. Like, if anybody was good at this, then it would be a much easier problem. And nobody's good at it. Like, nobody knows how to, how to do this in 100% of cases. There's too many variables. So um, we had tons of people tell us that the total market, the VC, when we talked to people to raise money at the beginning of GitHub, and we, never, we didn't for, for a long time, we bootstrapped, but... We did have conversations, and people would tell us the, the total market cap of, of a company like GitHub in the best possible circumstance would be $100 million, right? And so uh, three really? months ago, we sold it for $7 billion. Like, it's like that one company, that's what they thought the whole market cap of the industry was. Um, and, so, and they were smart guys that knew a lot of stuff, right? That had been in a lot of companies. So, you know, do what you like doing, right? I, I, th I feel like it's harder to regret that, whether it works out or not. 
What is your opinion on the competition in your language learning market? <sighs> um, I have lots of opinions on the competition in my language learning market. I, I don't think anything that doesn't involve human beings um, will ever work for you, right? So if, if, you're, if you do want to learn another language, you have to do something where you're talking to a human being. So if it's a Duolingo or a Babel or something, you're, if you want to be successful at it, you'll have to combine it with something else. You can do italki, you can do some other tutor marketplace, which ends up being a lot of overhead for you. I think the way, the reason that, that I started the, the, the Chatterbug company, which combines these sort of methods of, of doing sort of digital study on your own and then connecting with human beings and practicing it and going back and forth, is, is it's important to have those conversations, to use it in real life with real human beings. Um, and so, any of the, the solutions out there that don't involve human beings, I think it are essentially snake oil, right? Because they're saying you can learn, anything that says you can learn Japanese in five minutes a day is straight up lying to you. Um, unless they think learn Japanese means like, you know, I learned a word of Japanese, therefore I learned Japanese technically, right? Like it's, it's, not, it's not really the same thing. So um, there are good systems and services. I think most of them don't know how to take advantage of technology and the internet to, to really do it well, right? Um, I, I, I think that, that technology really could be amazing for helping connect you to other people in a way that is much more efficient with your time and helps you learn a language in a real way, in a real ap applicable, practical way. Um, and I'm excited to see that, whether it's Chatterbug or not, that gets to that, that point in the end, I'm excited to see technology really help people learn languages better because I think it's important for everybody. It's important for us as societies to not be so tribal. I mean, all, every country, I mean, America is a particularly horrible example of this right now of sort of, you know, racism and, 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 uh, and, and inward thinking tribalness. Um, but, but I think every, Brexit, every country in Europe has, has these problems and I think connecting with human beings, with language and learning different cultures and opening up to things that aren't what you're used to is a really valuable thing for humanity. So I, I, I'm excited that, that I think technology can really help in this manner and, and it, it hasn't yet. Interesting that you did not um, put the others down right now when you had the opportunity to, so <laughs> good, good for you. How do you find employment laws in Germany in comparison to the U.S. ones? Uh, I actually love employment laws in Germany because they care about Germans, right? I think that employment laws in the United States are, are really employer-friendly in a way that is... The definition of that to American companies is not worker-friendly, right? Um, I love the fact that we have to pay more taxes here, but I don't have to personally worry about employees when they go on paternity leave or maternity leave or when they get sick or, or I don't have to worry about how to provide them with health care, right? Like in, in American companies, I have to figure out how to insure all of my employees. I don't want to do that. That is not what I'm good at as a businessman, right? Like I want to build my product. I don't want to care about if you get cancer, is that going to be, is that going to ruin your life, right? Because I didn't get you the right insurance or, or, or I didn't want to, to have the company pay more money for that. I love not having to worry about that in, in Germany as, as much. Um, and, and I wish that the United States was like that, honestly, as well. Um, I think that it's horrible that, that I have to care about those things, and that puts me at a competitive disadvantage to my competitors in the United States that don't care about that, that stuff, right, and wanna, would prefer to cut corners and, and screw their, their employees. Um, because they can, and, and, and I don't want to do that. It's actually a huge pain in the ass because we have employees in the United States and in Germany, and it's really kind of unfair to have different benefits for them, right? And so we're trying to make sure that all of our employees kind of have the same benefits, and it's almost impossible to do because, because Germany is so much more friendly to, to employees than, than in the United States, and so we have to massively overpay in the United States um, and and t t try to get them to sort of German levels of, of employment, and and it's embarrassing, right? It's it's an embarrass it's embarrassing as an American that that that's how you have to run a company. Um, I, I, like it, hi, taxes are higher, it's it's more difficult, I think, to start a business and stuff here. But I think in a good way, right? I think it should I think it should be this way, um, and I wish the, the America was was better at it. Very interesting opinions. I think. We might have time for one or two more questions from the audience. Um, 
Would you mind coming up front, like the two who were first? Uh, yeah, you can come as well, and then you, I'll give you the mic. I'll let you start. Hi. Um, on uh, Sly.do, the warm main question, or most liked question, was about the dangers uh, of uh, open source um, after. A, a, uh, how, what's the right word in English? Um, after acquisition of uh, GitHub uh, by Microsoft, don't you see um, the open source world now in danger after this? Um, that's a great question. I, I can't say that I can say definitively. Like, I don't know what Microsoft is going to do. Uh, I, I know a lot of the people at Microsoft, but it's a huge company as well. I think from my perspective, Every, almost everybody that would have been involved in open source at this point is involved in open source that, that hates Microsoft. Um, and the people that love Microsoft, a lot of them are still not involved in open source, and Microsoft can bring them to the table. So um, uh, by, by sort of legitimizing it in a, in a section of developers that, that would never do open source before. And so I think from the, the effect of, of growing the open source community, having somebody that has traditionally not been seen as a great friend of open source, but has in the last 10 years been amazing for open source, actually. We've, they've been the only company that I can think of that we have, at GitHub, even years ago, worked with very closely to develop a lot of technology. So we did libgit2, was mostly funded by Microsoft, um, and we kind of led the project, but every competitor uses libgit2, and, and a huge amount of that code base was written by Microsoft. A lot of the open source, like they, they maintain a lot of open source projects internally now. It's a huge deal for them. Satya, I think, is, is really pro open source, and so I think it's a big advocate, right? And, and everybody that doesn't like it, there's, luckily, there's lots of other places. You can go to GitLab, you can go to my friends at Atlassian, right? I mean, there are other places to put it out there, so I, I'm hoping it, it's going to be good. I'm optimistic that it's going to be good. I feel like if it does get fucked up for whatever reason, that it, it can go elsewhere, right? So that, that's my personal feelings, but we can, we can argue about it later as well, or you can take one free punch if you're really mad at me, and uh, I'll, I'll give that one to you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it'll be okay. I think talking about that over a beer is a good idea. So <laughs> let's do that later. I feel bad about offering that. He looks like a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your opinions of Larry Big Boy? Uh, you didn't mention Bitmover as one of the competitors of Get, GitHub at the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, Bit, BitKeeper, I feel like wasn't much of a, a, a competitor. Like we didn't see them in the space that much. They, I think they were innovative and interesting. And I think Git owes a lot to to, to Bitkeeper as as does GitHub by proxy, right? Um, but I mean, GitHub owes uh, any. This is the thing I I kind of is stupid about well, capitalism. Honestly, is that GitHub stood on thousands of people's shoulders, right? Like it's it's hard to say that that Linus. Uh, was more or less valuable for for his work on Linux and his work on Git, which we also used as as all of the other technologies that he built on top of, right, to, to do the things that he did, um, and and Rails and you know all of these other things that we MySQL and all of these other things that we took for free um, and contributed back to a lot of them, right? I mean, we paid an open source developer to concentrate on Git full time for several years. And, and when Junio would, would step away, PEF would come in and, and, and take over. Um, and I think we, were, we tried to be very good stewards of that, uh, uh, of, of the Git project and of open source in general, involving Microsoft and things like libgit2 and, and, and having that be generally available to everybody. But um, so yeah, I, I have no idea. Like, like I feel like it's, it's unfair to some degree that, that GitHub ended up being sort of the huge winner in this thing, but that have, that's true of every tech company, right? Every tech company uses a thousand other projects um, that were developed not for that company, but for other things that they're still taking advantage of. It's not like Git, you know, Linux isn't, isn't taking, using Git in a positive way that they wouldn't have with or without GitHub. Um, I think GitHub actually still hosts Linus's tree, um, but, but, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a zero-sum game, right? So I, I appreciate 
uh, everybody that was involved in everything. And I'm hoping that GitHub provided and uh, some open source software that some other company will you know do really well with, or that you guys are using to make your development easier, um, hopefully, and and you'll be successful or not or whatever. But hopefully, it made it easier to get there. Um, well, hopefully, it didn't make it easier to get to unsuccessful, but it made it easier to do the job that you wanted to do. And I think that's kind of the ecosystem, right? Um, and, and, you know, I mean, we can go down a different path of who deserves what, but that's, that's, more, that's, that's more of a beer talk of, of you know, <laughs> what's wrong with capitalism. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> it kind of, kind of went all over the place. I love open source, though. So thank you all for the questions. And I think there's a lot of time to talk to Scott at the bar over a beer. <laughs> and ask some more questions or follow up on the conversations and uh, discussions right now. So thank you all for joining, um, especially you, Scott. Yep. Um, thanks for taking the time. And, and my Twitter handle is just Chacon. If you have any other questions, just DM me. I've opened DMs. Um, I'm happy to you know, meet with you guys, answer any questions, do whatever, even if you don't have time now. I'm in Berlin every month, so I, like, I, I live here part-time, so it's not like um, this is the only time I'll be here. So just let me know what you're working on. I'm fascinated. Um, thank you so much for having me as well. It's been great to be here. Trick 17. Thanks. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> you can also send him a message on LinkedIn. It works. I went out for a beer <laughs> with him. That's how we connected. So it works pretty well just for everybody who can't reach him on Twitter. Just wanted to make sure that you reach him really and uh, can sit down with him. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to Factory. Thanks a lot to you as an audience. And yeah, happy drinking. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>